All right, we're starting so, uh, now. Are you good? Do you want to try and just do a, a quick uh, synopsis, Sam, when we when we go? Do you want um, to do a a synopsis for a movie that none of us has seen? Yes, actually, yeah. nobody has seen because it's a um, it's a lost film. Nobody, maybe living, has seen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of uh, Presenting Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Kenny. With me, as always, is Sam and Lance. Hello. This episode, we will be uh, reviewing Alfred Hitchcock's lost film, The Mountain Eagle. Uh, Sam, we want to tell people what this movie is about. Uh, yeah, well, as you said just now, um, it is lost. So uh, we can only go by contemporary accounts and the stuff that we read in books. But according to what we understand, this um, this movie is about a uh, school teacher who's unjustly accused of um, being a wanton woman, the uh, terminology of the day. And um, she is brought under the protection of a mysterious hermit named uh, John Fearagod Fulton. And um, I don't know, I don't know what it's all about, frankly, um, but <laughs> it does sound like it has a, a few themes that we've heard so far in Hitchcock. There's angry mobs, there's, there's um, uh, you know, justice, injustice, there's uh, injustice, there's a falsely accused person there's a there's a woman in distress um it's got it all and uh that was really really not a very helpful synopsis but yeah so. sam after that summary it's it's like it's a colossal letdown that i can't go and watch this film now you really sold it for me buddy <laughs> so this video is what hopefully what this video is going to be is a collection of every known photograph and we're going to go over everything all in one place uh so you, you don't have to look up mountain eagle anywhere else uh, you don't have to this is it it's your one-stop shop you'll see everything we see if you find something that i didn't put in here please put it in the comments uh but i really looked so bear with me here's what we've got for you starting with uh the truffaut book hitchcock which my edition is from 1984 there were only six photos that remained at that point of the Mountain Eagle. They're all black and white photos, and they're all reprinted within that book. Moving on, J.L. Coons, who we will talk about later, is a Hitchcock scholar who thought to look through Hitchcock's personal collection of photographs. Uh, I'm not sure if this was after Hitchcock himself had died. Probably was where he found a bunch of behind the scenes and a bunch of black and white photos uh, stills from the movie. I'm not sure on the exact count. A lot of those are reprinted in Dan Euler's book, uh, Hitchcock Lost, which is an ebook online. But we have here 11 behind the scenes photos, which I'm presuming is from that. And we have 22 black and white photos I've just found from around the web, which I'm also going to assume is from that. So moving on, the next thing we have is there was one lobby card, which was found at a it was found at an antique shop in Rowley, Massachusetts. The other thing that we need to th talk about is in 2012, there was a sale on Heritage Auctions, which had 24 11 by 14 stills from the Mountain Eagle that were also, I guess, apparently belonged to Hitchcock at one point, but they didn't say who the seller was. So we're not exactly sure who had these. Unfortunately, all 24 of them are not available online anywhere. Uh, I was not able to find them. I did find eight of them, six from the Heritage Auction site and two more from online. So whether or not the other 16 are versions of the black and whites, because a few of these master prints looked a lot like the black and white pictures I saw that we were going to show you. We kind of put these pictures into a chronological order so you can kind of so we can guess at what the movie is about 
at the end of this video, we'll talk more about that heritage sale. We'll also be showing you a couple of advertisements that had artwork. There's literally hundreds of newspaper clippings at uh, HitchcockZone.com that I would encourage you to go there if you're more interested. You want to see these printed in uh, newspapers from the time, you know, telling you to go see this movie. Uh, we just picked ones that had artwork just so that we could kind of guess a little bit at what happens in the movie based on that artwork. But yeah, that's another place I would go. We really want to be as exhaustive as possible at this site with everything here. So if you know of any pictures, if your grandfather has a picture in his collection that we don't have here, definitely send it along to us. We'll make a special shorter video with any updates or things along the lines going forward. We won't add them to this video, but we'll make a couple of short videos for anything new that turns up. It was filmed in October, November of 1925. It was filmed on location in the Austrian Tyrol Mountains and at the Melka Studios near Munich, which was the same place where they filmed much of the Pleasure Garden. Uh, editing was completed back in London in 1925, and the first uh, show, or the premiere, was in May of 1926 in Berlin. We also know the length of the movie based on reports at the time. Uh, when it premiered in London, it was 7,503 feet which would have been about 100 minutes, which seemed to already be too long for us Americans because our copy was cut to 6,000 and then 5,302 feet, which is about 80 minutes and 71 minutes, respectfully. Hitchcock historian uh, J.L. Coons wrote an essay on the film in 1998 suggesting there might only have been four prints total in circulation. Two in Britain, one in Germany, and one that was sent to the U.S. Uh, this would explain why the odds of it surviving are so low. We've kind of talked about lost movies a little bit, and one thing we're learning is most of these silent movies before 1929, I think in the Survival of American Silent Feature Films article, which is written by a historian from the BFI, he says only 14% of American silent films from that period are still around. Multiple reasons there were, these were filmed on nitrate film, which we have come to learn uh, is very flammable. If you've seen, uh, what's the uh, Quentin Tarantino movie? Oh, uh, Inglourious oh. Bastards. Inglourious yeah. Bastards, yes. Uh, they apparently will stay on fire even underwater. So, and they also would just naturally crumble on their own over time. So these two factors, so this is the way in the 1930s they thought of silent films by Los Angeles Times drama critic Edward Schallart. Making pictures is not like writing literature or composing music or painting masterpieces. The screen story is essentially a thing of today and once it has had its run, that day is finished. So far there has never been a classic film in the sense that there is a classic novel or poem or canvas or sonata. Last year's picture However strong its appeal at the time is a book that has gone out of circulation. Not I'm glad opinions have been revised <laughs> on that score. But you're, you're, you know, that's a really interesting perspective because, uh, you know, at this point, film and, and theater were kind of like, they, they were, it was evolving out of theater and a lot of the conventions of these early films seem very much like stage theatrical people probably thought of them as the same thing. A movie will have its run. And once the run is over, it ceases to exist, which is thankfully no longer the case. Yeah, it was a commodity. They were just, and they were obviously cranking them out at a pretty prodigious rate. Um, Cause I think Hitchcock would directed like three or four movies in a single year. So they were, they were, uh, you know, just kind of cranking out these, you know, consumer products that had nobody imagined them having a long shelf life. Although the Mountain Eagle is number one on the BFI's most wanted lost film list. Um, and another Hitchcock movie turned up recently in New Zealand, right? Um, in someone's vault somewhere. So these things do happen. Films mysteriously reappear after um, a century now. So one, one little note that I remember reading, and I, and I don't have anything to cite right now, um, but the Mountain Eagle... Um, you know, it takes place in in uh, Appalachia, 
um, it was filmed in Germany, but it's like uh, supposed to be America. Anyway, uh, the the thing that I remember reading about is that there were a couple movies about you know backwoods guys that came out the year previous and that were huge hits. So this might have been a movie that was made um, because of uh, you know there was like a perce perceived market for it. You know, we were wondering before like why would Alfred Hitchcock in Germany make a movie about rural Kentucky? And maybe the answer is movies about like rednecks in rural Kentucky were uh, were big that year. Yeah, I mean, Apothesis. unlike The Pleasure Garden, which was based on a best-selling hit novel, uh, this was based on a short story by Charles Lapworth called Fear of God. Charles Lapworth actually worked for Gainsbourg Pictures. He was a journalist. So it sounds like he was just a guy they knew and they asked him to write a story about uh, a mountain man because it was popular, like Sam just said. So I'm... You know, I can't find very much on him. I tried doing a little research on Charles Lackworth. I found a lot of genealogy pages where people are like, hey, that's my uncle, and I wish we knew more about him. <laughs> you know, so Elliot Stannard is credited again with writing the screenplay, along with Max Ferner, a German playwright. Uh, Stannard, we know, did The Pleasure Garden. Max Ferner uh, might have been brought in because maybe he knew more uh, about mountaineering or... Appalachia. Uh, I don't know. There's not much you can find about him online. Well, that, that's something too. I think we've, we've discussed this in the past. That there's not like a guarantee since nobody's seen the movie. I guess the script does indicate that it was took place in Appalachia. But looking at those reviews that are online, these fragments um, that we'll read later, none of them actually say anything about it being in Appalachia. So I think that the verdict is still out whether or not the movie was was really, I mean, I, I don't think there's really any way to know for sure. Yeah, in fact, film scholar J.L. Coons uh, was disputing whether there's any evidence as to the, you know, the, the setting of the film. And the evidence that is there are the reviews, some of which place it in Europe, some of which do in the American uh, Northwest, some in Kentucky. So, there is the theory that the location was on a card, on a intertital card that wow. varied by print. But, um, but that's only a theory because there's no print that exists. These are all uh, gonna be theories today. So if we find that yeah. card, the mystery will be solved. So <laughs> yeah, the internet sleuths out there get to work. Find us that card. I don't know, my, my money is on, this is a, an American story. Wait, I just wanted to start with you, this, uh, going over this really quick with uh, the vamp phase of silent film. This is Theda Barra. She was the first vamp actress. She basically vamp short for vampire. You know, Dracula had been popular at the time. And this kind of thing caught on with silent film where women uh, who were very sensual, sexual, exotic looking. Uh, Theda Barra started wearing her makeup this way and a lot of other actresses started to follow, including, uh, including Nita Naldi, who is our star of The Mountain Eagle, a vamp actress of the time, uh, cast against type in The Mountain Eagle, I guess, from what I've read. Hitchcock wasn't too thrilled, I guess, with, uh, you know, she's playing a school teacher in The Mountain Eagle. Uh, in a rural kind of mountain town. Yeah, I guess trails. he clashed with her over her, you know, appearance, which was, like you said, she was definitely cast uh, against type. She's uh, supposed to be this wholesome school marm. And, uh, and she, in, I guess, insisted on kind of maintaining her, her, you know, vamp image throughout. And I would be interested to see what she looked like in the film. Yeah. I mean, other than the stills that we have. Yeah, I just kind of want to go over the whole vamp thing, just because it kind of sets the backstory for her showing up for this movie. And uh... I think that gives you an idea too of how Gainsborough Pictures must have run, where um, you know the stars were picked by the studio, not the director. The director of this, the film in this case, Alfred Hitchcock, who this is his second feature, um, just had to make do with what they got. Okay, so this is the only 
known poster for the Mountain Eagle in German, Der Bergadler, which I looked up the translation for, and that is a direct translation of the Mountain Eagle. So it's interesting that the top listed actor here is Bernhard Goetz, who was a German actor. Every other advertis advertisement we see will have uh, Nita Naldi as the uh, main star of the movie. Sam, you want to take uh, what Bioscope had to say in October of 1926 about this movie? I would like nothing more. Um, so uh, the Bioscope said this about the Mountain Eagle. Beatrice Brent, school teacher in a small mountain village, incurs the enmity of Pettigrew, the local justice of the peace and owner of the village stores, because he believes that she encourages the attentions of his son, Edward, a cripple, who takes evening lessons. Pettigrew, while questioning Beatrice, is himself influenced by her charm, and he attempts liberties, which she strongly resents. He's so furious at the rebuff that he proclaims her as a wanton, and she's driven from the village by the inhabitants. Beatrice is saved from their fury by a mysterious stranger known as Fearagod, who lives a solitary life in a cabin to which he takes her for shelter. To stop all scandal, Fearagod takes Beatrice down to the village and compels Pettigrew to marry them, explaining to her that uh, he will help her get a divorce. Beatrice, however, is content to leave the situation as it is, but Pettigrew, furious with rage, takes advantage of that fact as his son has left the village and arrests Fearagod for his murder in spite of the fact that there is no vestige of evidence that young Pettigrew has, has been murdered, Furagod is kept in prison for over a year when he decides to escape. Oh my God, can you <laughs> believe? This is like a hard to follow and plot. I'm reading it. Yeah, it's a very convoluted plot. Okay, continuing. He finds that his wife has a baby and he goes off with them to the mountains. When they find that the baby is taken ill, Furagod goes back to the village for a doctor where he sees old Pettigrew. Some doubt as to which of the men is going to attack the other first is settled by an onlooker firing off a gun, which wounds Pettigrew in the shoulder. The sudden return of his son, Edward, convinces the old man of the futility of proceeding with his accusation of murder. So he makes the best of matters by shaking hands with the man he has persecuted and all is supposed to end happily. Um, that was the bioscope. Um, I'm sorry if that was hard to follow. Uh, I barely followed it myself, but it's a, it's a pretty um, poorly written synopsis of what we understand to be the plot of the Mountain Eagle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing is with these with these reviews is this is basically the only actual concrete evidence that we have about what the plot is because there's really no other, outside of a couple of people who actually saw it, there's no script, there's no, obviously there's no film. And just looking at this poster one more time, I'm seeing, I mean, obviously these don't look like the people in the movie, but we have uh, probably Fear of God here shooting at someone and he's defending probably uh, Nita Naldi and a baby, which is basically kind of what you described there. All right, so let's, let's move on to uh, the next picture, I guess. And in here, we have a lobby card uh, that was found in Massachusetts at an antique store from what I've read online proving that the title of the movie was The Mountain Eagle in the United States. There was some speculation, if you get into the weeds of Hitchcock lore, that the movie was called Fear of God in the United States. Not true. Uh, this dog is also a star of the movie, and I believe his name is Major. All right, Lance, you want to take the Kinematograph Weekly? Certainly. So the, yeah, this review comes from the Kinematograph Weekly. Pettigrew JP of, of a small mountain village hates John Fulton, a lonely dweller in the mountains known as fear of God to the inhabitants. As much as he loves his son, Edward, who was born a cripple as his mother, whom Fulton also loved, died. <laughs> okay. Pettigrew sees his son apparently making love to Beatrice Talbot, the village school mistress, and going to reprove her, he tries to take her in his arms. The son sees this and leaves the village. Pettigrew, determine, Pettigrew determines to have Beatrice thrown out, but Fear of God intervenes and takes her to his cabin. Pettigrew here sees the chance to arrest Fear of God for abduction and Beatrice as a wanton, but Fear of God forestalls him by coming and demanding that Pettigrew marry them. The pair then fall in love, but Pettigrew has Fear of God arrested and thrown into prison on a charge of murdering his son who has not returned. Fear of God breaks out of prison after a year and attempts to fly with his wife and child, 
uh, but the latter falls sick and Fair God returns to the village for a doctor. There he finds Edward has returned and his affairs cleared up. Pettigrew is accidentally shot, sort of added there on the end. Tack on at the end there. Yeah, a little bit of a denouement. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds, it's, it's almost like they sound slightly different reading these different reviewers and we have no script to go on, but um, I mean, it's still the, in, in broad strokes, they're still the same, but, um, but I, I don't, the, the fact that he, Pettigrew sees his son apparently making love to Beatrice Talbot, I don't know where else that, that appears because that's pretty explicit. Did, did you guys? Have you yeah, heard? I was wondering if making love was maybe a strong term for it. Maybe just he, he thought he saw them doing something. Yeah, maybe like a trip in there. I don't know. You know, you don't know with this. I think that that term used to mean um, just declaring love or romantic affection, like not, a, like a forward. No, I, I think it stopped a, a little short of that. No, I was going to say, you're not a big fan of dogs from uh, the Pleasure Garden. I'm just wondering, you got any take on this one? Does he look like a good I think, I think Major, lo- yeah, he looks like a very good boy. I, and um, I want to make sure the record is uh, clear. I am not against dogs in any way. I, I, I love a good canine uh, companion. I'm just against the device in a movie of the dog being the, um, the moral... Uh, you just don't like cuddles but cuddles i thought i thought cuddles was a little bit of a a hack yeah yeah it was cringeworthy there also that's a big theme too is that we don't know what role the dog but he's clearly got a big one because he's right there on the lobby card (laughs) yeah and and he's in some of the uh, promo photos that we see so just like the other three movies uh the the dog is uh playing a you know an outsized role for you know a pet it's a striking dog would not be out of place in uh say the austrian alps um (laughs) or kentucky the alps of kentucky yeah right (laughs) okay so let's move on to uh next picture this is i i added a couple in the advertisements where they would have an image with whatever was in the newspaper just so that every image is kind of covered here so it is a very faded photo of uh nita naldi as beatrice and uh edward the cripple boy, I guess, as he's described. Yeah, that's not the uh, preferred nomenclature, is it? The, yeah. We were just we were reading from reviews from the twenties. Just uh, to be clear, that's not what we would refer to someone with a disability as. But that is what people uh, said back then. Yeah, we we'll, we have some pictures of him coming up. We can maybe try to see what they're trying to say. His problem is. Yeah. Anyway, she's his teacher, and uh, that's there. She is Nita Naldi in the Mountain Eagle. He looks pretty hot for teacher though in that, yeah. that big picture. So it's kind that, of that might be lovemaking right there, circa you know, 1920s. That's how it was done in those days. Just with the I, eye. I gotta say the, the journalistic standards of the time, playing fast and loose with the English language, just clauses uh, you know, thrown haphazardly at the ends of sentences, um, punctuation and afterthought no structure to the writing at all. It's like, you would never think it, but like, you know, Buzzfeed sounds more journalistic than this stuff. <laughs> I think people were dumber in the old days. The, the standards of journalism were not always high, at least not in the uh, papers that we're reading from here. Hmm. At the Nile, need an Aldi star of the Mountain Eagle to be shown at Nile tomorrow with five acts of vaudeville. You wonder who's, doing the artwork is it's i guess it's someone at the newspaper sure yeah yeah, the illustrations. So. yeah. also uh sharing the bill with with live entertainment a movie as part of like a that was a night a out nay yeah all right so i'm gonna read the last uh, review one from the gloucester citizen august 1927 so the movie's been out for a little bit at this point The principal picture to be seen at the Palladium throughout the present week is the Mountain Eagle, a story of love and hatred amongst mountain folk. There is a feud over a woman between one Fulton and Pettigrew. The latter, as the local justice in the small village, naturally has considerable power. His crippled son, Edward, falls in love with Beatrice Brent, the school teacher appointed by his father, and gossip is right. I'd like to stop right here and say Beatrice Brent. Her name was Beatrice 
something else in the other review that you read, Sam. Talbot. Beatrice Talbot. That's weird that her name would be different in two different reviews. Well, that was Lance's review. Yeah, mine, yeah. mine was Brent. So I, I think Lance or the odd one out. It's so maybe he was done. just wrong. I think the kinematograph was wrong and by extension, Lance was wrong. All right. His crippled son, Edward, falls in love with Beatrice Brent, the school teacher appointed by his father and gossip is ripe. The narrative unwinds, as it were, from this incident. Beatrice has to seek refuge with Fulton, who arranges a marriage to still the tongues. And Edward, having fled, suspicion of having caused his death falls on Fulton. There are some striking snow scenes and fine mountain scenery and many exciting moments such as when Fulton levels his rifle to shoot Pettigrew and the latter faints and falls before a shot can reach him. Instances in which the suspense is very ably contrived. The pursuit of Fulton across the snow plains is done with decision and force. Thank you, the, Gloucester Citizen. That was the first thing that resembled a real review there. Yeah. Yeah, there's, they were a little opinionated. They, they liked yeah. it a little bit. And, and thank yeah. you, Kenny, for uh, delivering it in an authentic uh, voice of the period. I think yeah, you're, the, the, you I got, think you're you, born too late, man. Yeah, I you got that good mid-Atlantic radio voice. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, I, I'm always looking for a place to use it, and it, believe it or not, it never comes up. So uh, here's another one that had art in it, which it looks like Pettigrew covering her mouth, Beatrice's mouth. Uh, and episode number four of The Terrible People will also be playing after this. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed that at the very bottom. Yeah, um, admission is 10 cents and 20 cents. Do, do you get to pick or? This one, what's interesting is uh, that the artwork depicts what I'm guessing is a uh, fear of God reaching through a window to strangle uh, this fellow who seems to have the one up on uh, Beatrice, which is kind of interesting because we have a photo of this later, but it's not clear from that photo that he's reaching through a window so that it's, this kind of could, might confirm that this that probably is a scene that happens in the movie, which would be, from a Hitchcock standard, an interesting thing to see. You have an open window behind a guy and then Fear of God, who seems a little sketchy looking to begin with, kind of reaching through with his big hands to strangle him would be a pretty suspenseful scene, I would imagine. Yeah, but, uh, but I, I, you know, these elements that we've been talking about, the, the um, deranged um, and righteous mob that is um you know being fought back against by the the misunderstood but noble outsider who's protecting uh the woman in distress these are these are all kind of interesting um story elements that that have appeared in alfred hitchcock movies and and you know movies more generally you probably shouldn't just put this on on hitchcock but i i like i like the recurring angry mob thing that yeah. we've seen in these these first couple movies because um it must have been a real uh fear at the time so i guess it's, it's kind of a common fear now yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we there was a there's definitely a uh a dip maybe mid-century in in fear of the mob but um maybe it's resurgent yeah, maybe these movies back. will have a new relevance yeah we're, we're entering a new golden age of mob violence so as as the uh, you know copyrights expire, maybe they're due for a reboot. You know, this could be Disney properties in the future. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So our last our last in advertisement is uh, they actually reused. This is the only time that this scene from the Mountain Eagle actually got used officially. It was on the cover of this Alfred Hitchcock Presents book, More Stories Not for the Nervous, where we see again. I'm guessing fear of God reaching through a bookcase at the library to strangle this guy yet again, eternally. That is a fantastic title for a book. I, I love it. More yeah, stories. I know. I kind of, part of me kind of wants to go find this thing now. More stories, not for the nervous. And I like that Hitchcock's reading a book that looks like it also has him on the cover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A true narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be it'd be great to get a hold of that exact edition with that illustration on the cover. That's beautiful. Yeah, something to look for, I guess, at the antique shops or uh, your hobby shops. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the behind the scenes photos, and first we're going to start with uh, a picture of. Can, can someone pronounce the town uh, this was filmed in? I 
I believe it's Ober Gurgle. Ober 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 O B E R G U R G L. Can't you just throw it into Google like okay. How do you spell it? O B E R G U R G L. Oh, yeah, that is a really odd. Um, I want to say I don't want to say it's Ober Gurgle, but it, I'll go with that. Ober Gurgle? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's how to funny pronounce, if it's incorrect. How to, how to pronounce dot com. I'm gonna play it. Obergurgle. Did you hear it? Oh, yeah. it sounded like Obergurgle. 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 Ober. Yeah. It's the hard yeah. Obergurgle. It's filmed in Obergurgle, which I'm sure this picture, which is pretty modern, is probably not very different from when Hitchcock was there. I mean, you know, the houses are newer, I'm sure, but. There's not, it doesn't look like a ton. So here we go. Speaking of Hitchcock and Alma Reville, uh, this is probably from his personal collection of, you know, his photos. They were engaged during this movie. And I think they were either married after this movie or after The Lodger. I don't really. After this movie. After this movie. Yeah. Yep, Alma Reville is listed as the assistant director on this movie. I think it was on IMDb, I saw that. She's in quite a few of these pictures too, the behind the scenes. So she clearly was involved in the filming. Or this looks this looks like it might have been taken in uh oh, this was taken in the uh at in Obergurgle. Obergurgle. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna say this this reminds me a little bit of the um one of the settings in the pleasure garden. Pleasure Garden didn't film in Ober Obergurgle, but they did film like most of the set stuff in the same at the Emory Studios. So the, oh. this is tied to the Pleasure Garden in that way. Okay. This is a famous photo. I think it's in the Hitchcock. I think it's in both Tash and Anne, the Hitchcock Truffaut book. But this was for a while, one of the only known set pictures from the Mountain Eagle. Obviously in the front, we have Alfred Hitchcock, Behind him, we have Alma Reville. Behind the camera is Gaetano de Ventimiglia, who was the cinematographer on Pleasure Garden, Mountain Eagle, and The Lodger, which will be next week, obviously. The other fella, no idea. And this is actually the full photo. I just wanted to put this in there because this guy has historically been cut out of the photo for you know, uh, like 80 years. So it's just kind of, I, I felt like he should be included. I don't know who he is, but it's clear why he's cut out the composition, you know. Alma Reville, uh, Hitchcock called her a script girl a few times, said back in the day, probably responsible for continuity. This is me guessing. Continuity, uh, you know, basically all the menial things that directors don't want to do. So they give them to someone of lower stature. Well, yeah, is that, that that's like a script supervisor, right? In contemporary, uh, yeah, terminology, just someone who makes sure that um, things are consistent from scene to scene, and yeah, you know, I think nowadays that's... on a movie, like I'm sure if you watch Captain America and whatever, whatever her job here is, there's like 30 people that do it now. They ran smaller crews back then. Here is a picture of them uh, apparently traveling into the Obergurgle location. What's interesting in this picture is they are standing with Malcolm Keane, who we're going to see a lot more of as we go on. He played Fear of God uh, in this movie. He's the star of the movie. He was a Gainsbourg actor. I don't think he ever did anything with Hitchcock previously, but they were definitely friends because I read some story that he was carrying the engagement ring with them to the set. And Hitchcock was more nervous about that than him getting there safely. I just, I just love these old pictures. One of my things with this whole silent era is just how different a hundred years ago is from today. And it's, this picture kind of says everything that they're traveling. Although maybe they're actually still using wooden carriages in Obergurgle today. I don't yeah. Those winding mountain roads, that, yeah, those you know, they're, not, they're not easily traversed. A lot of gas stations out there. Yeah. So, one interesting thing in this picture that you don't get from later pictures is that this actor on the left, who Bernard Gotsk, 
I don't know how to pronounce his name. Either. This is Pettigrew. The, uh, the Mr. Villain. Pettigrew, the villain of the movie, was a real tall dude. Uh, I've, I read this on IMDb as well. He played a lot of kind of villain characters. He's in like 100 movies. Uh, big time German actor, which is probably why his name was first on the German poster. But like, so just Alma Reville on a step stool with him standing there, just kind of underscore what a physical presence he would have been in this movie. I'd also like to point out, it looks like he is in Fear of God's Cabin. In the, if I'm looking at the background correctly, I see a, hmm. a teapot hanging on a ceiling. So this this could be a towards the end of the film type of a thing or anyways. We have, uh, now we have a couple of these cool shots out in the snow. You know, I mean, we talk about, we've read the reviews and the movie sounds like a, a mess, but there's that obviously that part of me that wants to see it. It's, it looks beautiful. The exterior shots I'm sure would be really great to watch. Uh, Pleasure Garden was surprisingly good. So we got uh, Major in the front here. So he's obviously filming today with uh, Hitchcock and Alma Reville. Next, we have all of them walking. It's probably the same day walking to the shot. All right, so this is a great picture. It's got uh, two. So if you start at the left, uh, second in is Alfred Hitchcock. Fourth in is Alma Reville. Sixth in is uh, Gaetano de Ventimiglia, the uh, cinematographer. In front of him is probably the dog handler, I'm guessing, with Major. And then in front of him is uh, Malcolm Keane, Fear of God. And then who knows, the rest of these guys are just, this guy looks like a local. Yeah, he's like the local, the local mountaineer guide. Yeah. Like yeah. Pipe and, I don't know, leader hosen. So we're, we're on our way to film something. This is probably also from the same time. And again, we've got uh, the same people here. We got Malcolm Keene here smoking a pipe, which in most of these behind the scene photos he is, which is kind of cool. This guy back here is the dog wrangler, which makes me think that they're filming something outdoors with Major right here. Yeah, I spent all, I spent all day putting these in order in line. So I've already kind of used the fine tooth uh, the scope on them. <laughs> I like I like Alma's style too here. I like the glasses, the white scarf. The... Yeah, she's kind of like got a Daphne. Velma. Yeah, I was going to say, is it Daphne or Velma? Sorry, Velma. You're correct. Yeah. Yeah, Vel mm -hmm. Velma was the smart one, right? Yes. The, oh, Velma yeah. had glasses. Yeah. Velma, Velma had glasses. Yeah. Okay, so we're filming something here. This is a really cool picture I found of not many of with Hitchcock with this much hair. So we got Hitchcock in the front, we got Alma Reville uh, in the back here. They're obviously actively filming something. Then uh, here's our hero, Malcolm Keene of the movie. I, I put this with the behind the scenes because this he doesn't look like he's in character as Fear of God right here. But he is in costume. Malcolm Keene's in three Hitchcock movies. He, we will see him in this, well, we won't see him here in this episode first. He will show up again next week in The Lodger. And I think he's either the star of The Manxman, which would be episode eight or nine. So three movies. So we get to see him again. Well, we get to see him for the first time next week. I love this picture. This is one that I just found this morning. And it is so great because this looks like they're just hanging out. They're in some small inn getting warm, having either coffee or whiskey. I don't know. Could be either. Malcolm Keene's in pajamas. His hair is a mess. Hitchcock looks stressed out. <laughs> he does. Yeah, he looks uh, dazed and confused. He's got that da uh, David Lynch hair right now. It's You almost feel bad that he had to lose it because he maybe could have would have kept that going. Yeah, it's a little bit of an eraser head kind of, mm -hmm. kind of look there. 
Elmerville uh, is just totally comfortable. That's what makes me think this is just a candid, somebody just took this picture. They, it, it doesn't look like a still publicity still or anything. They must be drinking alcohol. That bottle he's holding looks like alcohol, unless they're putting that in the coffee or something. Hitchcock is wearing slippers with what looks like Spider-Man socks. So ahead of Spider his time. Spider-Man socks? Yeah, can you see down here the webbing on his socks? Oh, just like as a, as a general. Uh, Who not, knew? Not, not Secretly loved character. the Marvel movies. <laughs> he was a, an MCU guy. Uh, this chair is totally broken too that he's Malcolm Keene's sitting in. All right. I just, I just love these, these things. This is another one. Uh, this is the last behind the scenes still. It's basically Hitchcock uh, and Elmerville uh, apparently showing uh, Beatrice how to use her gun, or Nita Naldi how to use, use the gun, which is- So put the, the strange uh, format of it. Was this at one point cut out? It looks like it- like yeah, th that. this one I found on like, at first I found that someone was trying to sell this picture. So it had all watermarks on it on like Pinterest. And then I had to do a deep internet search to find it again. It's not with most of the collections of it, their pictures. It does. I thought maybe it was someone peeking through something. No, no, it can't be because his hat is going over it. Yeah, it looks like it was part of like a, like a photo display, almost like it was cut out so that it could, like, you know, fold into a, like a cardboard cutout or, you know, maybe a promotional thing in a movie theater. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Nita, Nita Naldi kind of looks like Arya Stark to me right there. I don't know. That's... Mm. This is the kind of commentary you get, people, when the movie doesn't <laughs> exist, okay? This is what you're getting. You, at least you see the pictures. Make up your own minds. Starting the movie off. All right, so from everything we've read, Nita Naldi is playing Beatrice, the teacher of our young Edward Pettigrew. And here they are in class. Edward looking kind of sickly and wan. And a little older than maybe a, a child. Yeah. He was also, I'd read on the his IMDb page that uh, someone at Graham Cutts, I think a director at Gainsborough Pictures found him at a bank and just saw him and was like, hey, this kid's got the stuff. I'll put your name in lights. You want to be famous, kid? You know, it's the thing we all dream of. You know, when you're in the supermarket and you're a kid and you're like, if Steven Spielberg walks in and sees me, life-changing event. He was in a lot of movies about young boys until the sound era started and that was it. He was exposed for having a... Uh... What, what, what did his a voice very sound deep, like? Deep, deep, deep voice. Deep and resonant. <laughs> okay, so that's it. So apparently there's uh, these two like each other. Then uh, we have, who is this? This is uh, Bernard Goetz, our antagonist of the movie. I don't know what room they're in here. Uh, I like the clarity of this pic. This was probably a production still. It's just like a really sharp image. Has he caught her already, do we think? Maybe, maybe he said his suspicions to her. This guy, by the way, is also only 43, I think, when this movie was filmed. So he's wearing a lot of stage makeup. This might be the uh, the, the marriage scene. Looks like they might be in a courtroom of some kind. Oh, where she yeah. hasn't marry her? Yeah, maybe not. This could be a classroom, actually. Sorry. It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, I kind of hedged and threw it near the beginning to him uh, just because it was a really sharp looking picture of both of them. So this, I threw this in, this is another site had it, just to remind us that this movie would have been tinted. I know some of the pictures seem tinted, but I kind of just liked it. It's the only blue picture in the bunch. So definitely this is him uh, coming on to her. So we learned from the plot earlier that he, after thinking he caught her with his son or accusing her of being with his son, he then himself makes a move on her. A little bit more of that. And the son walks in and catches them. The son is clearly uh, cool because he's got his baseball hat on backwards. It looks like there's a full brim going around. It's kind of hard to tell, but I can see why you would think that that looks like a base backwards baseball cap. 
Now that you went, now I can't unsee it as a baseball hat backwards. So I'm trying to see that little thing as a feather, maybe, because they're in the mountains. Actually, if you look at the shadow, there's a front brim, right, in the shadow. Well, that's just the door. I don't know. It's a Monday, apparently, on the chalkboard. All right. Moving on. So apparently, I put this picture here because he's got his bag and it looks like he's leaving town. So it's this is uh, Edward has seen enough. He is upset with his father for uh, going after the love of his life, his teacher. And he's about, he does look a little frail and a little, like maybe he's got a limp, like scoliosis or something or? What is his, what is his handicap? What, what is his, uh, his disability? Because, you know, he leaves town for a year. He must not be that disabled. I don't know. That's true. We already know Obergurgel is, uh, Obergur we already know it's way out in the middle of nowhere. So for this kid to be able to go by himself, get out of town, find a place. Make his way for a year, yeah. That, that makes him more able-bodied than most people I know. Okay, moving on. Here he is, I believe. So this is the Pettigrew store. So maybe he's either stealing supplies to leave or something, but I, this is a, an interesting photo just because his dad is seeing him, which would lead me to believe that later when he accuses him of being murdered by fear of God, that we already would know that he knows that's BS. That's a, that's a solid deduction. I also deduct I have to let my cat in the room because he is crying outside the door. And if the music blasting from the cars isn't bothering people, <laughs> that might. So uh, his son has left town at this point and we have uh, Pettigrew now uh, telling uh, the townsfolks that um, Beatrice is a wanton and driving her from town. Spreading gossip and rumors. Gossip and rumors. This stirring the pot. This fella might be in pictures later on, or he might not. These could just be random town people. But uh, yeah, stirring the pot, kicking her out of town. So I kind of put in uh, these pictures here of her uh, leaving, her being thrown out of town. Hitchcock had a really great story that I read about how she, because she was uh, had this vamp kind of persona she was a lot of the local people and the people on the set were very hesitant and kind of scared working with her but i guess they filmed this scene of her being thrown out of town but uh, apparently because it's the silent era and uh, as we know we can't hear anything when she leaves she screams at the at the town people uh for accusing her of being a wanton or whatever else they're accusing her of and she gives this long speech, apparently, in the snow. And Hitchcock just was like, you know, go with it, wing it, do, do what, do, do something. And apparently she blew everyone's socks off, like to the point where after she did her whole rant at the town and left, you know, that everyone loved her and they stood up and applauded for her. It was a great scene. And it, apparently that was where she was won over and became one of the crew. It's a, it is interesting because we've had the discussion, I think, in the Pleasure Garden where like, what is the script exactly? So this is kind of an instance of where it seems the actors were just basically improvising, knowing that you weren't going to hear them anyway. And a, a one title card would just explain what was happening. And one more shot of her. I, I, this could have gone anywhere in this. She has the vamp. She definitely has the vamp haircut, the Eddie Munster widow's peak. I say she's got that widow's peak, but it's just a yeah. dead giveaway. Yeah. This woman drinks blood. This is our Malcolm Keene, fear of God. She makes it to his cabin uh, somewhere out in the woods to escape the town. And uh, this is them meeting up here. Not much to say, looks a little imposing at first. This is a much better promo photo that's super clear. Might be the best quality photo I've seen of those that you've shown so far. He's got a bird's nest in there at the top. That's where his mountain eagle lives. That's yeah. That maybe that's where the maybe there was a, an actual eagle in the movie. We'll never know. We can only. This is a movie about an eagle. Yeah, a pet eagle that could talk. 
What do we think? What do we think he's doing here with the scissors and the uh, cloth? Pressing a wound. That's right. He does bandage the baby, doesn't he? But did are they? Do they have a baby yet in this scene, or we don't know? I think they I could. think this is when they're deciding to take it to the town. There, there was some mention of the baby being ill and him bandaging it. Um, oh, I really? Oh, I yeah. Read that. Yeah. Which, um, you know, would you'd think? Well, maybe the maybe the baby got like a like physically like a cut or something, but yeah, we're, a... we're vague on specifics. We don't know. Okay. Yeah. So that might be that again. I just threw these in the order that seems somewhat logical, but you guys clearly are onto something there. Well, maybe she was wounded when she was you know chased from the village by the by the villagers and uh he was dressing you know her wounds i don't know how how far that scene is because there's no baby in that scene but yeah that that could be much later we could be yeah that's i tried to lump all the shots of him in this white shirt with stripes into the earlier section so i just i think that was my continuity uh <laughs> plan this is a great uh, stud shot of Malcolm Keane. Uh, I thought he had a white streak in his hair from a lot of these pictures, but this one seems to squash that. Maybe it's just lighting. But this looks like it's from him making her tea from the previous shot. Yeah, he doesn't have an iron in that secluded mountain cabin. Yeah, no. They pull the pants up really pretty high too, huh? <laughs> they do. Good back in those days. He, he obviously, the. I don't know if it, the silent era, is it blue eyes that are just more striking? I feel like there's a lot more blue eyed people because when you see them in these things, they really look almost otherworldly. Yeah, it looks like he's got cataracts or like mm. there's some, could have been a filter. Yeah, the... I do notice that with these these black and white stills, people that have blue eyes, their, their eyes are very um, unreal looking, ethereal. So this is obviously that he's got the same teapot here from that last scene. So that's, these go together. This is a much less quality photograph. But we got the electric light in the foreground here. Do we think that that would last one, these, the, the high quality ones are production stills and these are maybe um, from the actual film? Yeah, that's or, a question. Well, yeah, in this one, her her eyes are closed, so I would, I would think that maybe this would be more likely a, a still from the film, right? This picture is real sharp. I, I had one of these that was very blurry and now I thought it was just a behind the scenes picture, but then now this is so well, this is such a good picture. You can see they're actually acting here. So it's gotta be from the movie. And as you can see, this is outside of the Pettigrew local store, it says on it, which is the one, uh, Pettigrew Sr. was peeping his son through earlier. So this, maybe this is where he's, they've come back into town and he is, so the idea if I'm, if I'm remembering and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you will, um, but he, uh, and he, to make her an honest woman, they decide to come back and, and have Pettigrew, who I guess is also among his, his other duties is the justice of the peace. So he would be the person marrying them, right? So that's what I'm guessing they're there for on the steps of his store. I don't know. I'm speculating, but what do you, what, what's I think, your... I think you're right. I think that's, I think they, there, he came back with the idea of marrying her here and the town folk are all just kind of gawking because they have nothing else to do. They're just waiting for that moment where they could just chase someone. <laughs> just get their, get their pitchforks out and, you know. Do you guys think this is a set or is this a location? Looks like a set to me. Yeah, I'm gonna say it does set. kind of. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I've got the laundry on the line back here. I oh yeah, I love it. I think it looks great. Jump, huh? All right, so yeah, so assuming that he came back to town to uh, marry her, make her an honest woman, I put the next picture is an outraged Pettigrew, who is totally peeved off and uh, also decides to accuse him of murdering his son at this point. He looks demonic here, but not necessarily outraged, right? He looks like he's got the power. Like he's like, he's just one up somebody in a, or just one chest, like some kind of. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like a look of, uh, oh, yes, I did, you know? Yeah. 
I know I'm lying or I know I'm making this stuff up, but what are you going to do? Nothing. I'm the J to the P in this small town. So, uh, so I cut from that to, uh, uh, him, I'm assuming, so now this is, this is what I call the second act of the film or the final act where he's in a different shirt. This is the, uh, Agent Cooper is going to be staying in Twin Peaks, folks. He has got the flannel, and uh, this is either after he's escaped from prison, apparently, or at some point at that point. Uh, I put this here thinking this is maybe where she's telling him the baby's sick. He just got home from uh, one year in prison. His she eyes look really strange in this photo. <laughs> yeah. It's the one that stood out to me in the uh, in the Hitchcock Truffaut book. It's one of the original six, and it's where I thought he had the white streak of hair. Yeah, I see it too. In fact, she's no, got I, one as well. Oh, to indicate the passage of time, perhaps. Hard time at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the prison in this town is like one cell, and he's the only guy in it. Right. <laughs> And Pettigrew is the jailer because, you know, he does everything else in the town. So this is Lance. Why don't you, Lance, you, you explained to me what this picture was. So why don't you take it? What? I, oh, I, thought, I thought this was just some dramatic chase in the snow, but you uh, pointed something out about it to me. Uh, it's a football game. He's holding a, actually, um, yeah, he's holding, holding a, or they wouldn't be playing football. It would be, yeah. Uh, rugby. Rugby, yes. Yeah, they're playing rugby. Um, no, it looks like he's holding a baby and he's taking the sick baby back to town. Right? Isn't that what yeah, you're that's, that's, really surprised? Yeah. I think you're 100% right on that. He's, he's tramping through the backwoods of, you know, what is what is quite obviously the backwoods of Kentucky or the Ozarks or wherever this movie is supposed to be. We're, we're going to guess Major is his dog, right? Does that make the most sense? Yeah, because animals hate Pettigrew. So yeah, it could only be <laughs> only be his dog. So uh, maybe this is maybe maybe he's got Major with him here because we saw them filming in the snow with Major and you can and see him. Major's footprints actually if you, if you look carefully. <laughs> I think those are oh major. yeah. You might you might be right. There might be some dog footprints down here. So okay. So we got uh, Beatrice waiting at home for uh, news of the baby that's what i'm guessing beatrice is now dressed a little bit more seductively than she was earlier as the school teacher she's got a low cropped dress on i think i read somewhere as well that uh alma reville saying that she uh was only supposed to wear one costume and she got really upset about that and made them go shopping to buy her more clothes so yeah apparently she was a bit of a prima donna on the set but they they wound up being great friends anyway yeah. you know difficulties this is a really cool shot i'm guessing uh this could be fear of god that we we read that fear of god shoots there's apparently a scene where he shoots at pettigrew and pettigrew faints right before the bullet gets to him this could also be someone just hunting after pettigrew and, and uh beatrice the story is that Pettigrew faints when he gets shot at. Yeah, and one of those reviews we read, they said there's a dramatic scene where he shoots, aims his rifle and shoots at Pettigrew, and Pettigrew faints right before the bullet gets to him. So, so that's a good pro tip if you're ever like in a crossfire, just faint. Just faint. I, I, I kind of lumped together the action bits towards the end because I'm, I'm basing on from uh, Pleasure Garden you know, the movie took a weird turn in the third act. So I'm kind of with this one going action movie for the uh, finale. So, uh, and I think the finale based on what I put here is happens at their cabin. So it's like a race back to uh, Beatrice. He's being chased. And uh, so we have Beatrice holding down the fort at the uh, cabin with the gun, as we saw earlier, uh, Hitchcock and Alma Reville showing her how to hold it, load it. Kind of a good shot. She looks fierce. Then we have this guy from the uh, from our paperback book cover. I'm guessing this is maybe either a bounty hunter or some type of a. I think there's one or two bounty hunters, or just like the the 
top tough guys in town trying to find her. So we don't know who this guy is. He's not listed in the cast or anything. Very creepy. Again, blue eyes. Bad teeth. Kind of reminds me of the uh, God is in his holy temple guy from Poltergeist 2. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I do. Yeah, that really... He died like the day after that movie fil finished filming. Uh, it's Look into it. Like my work is wow. done here. I can now die. I can now die. I have been the creepy. Move on to the spirit realm. <laughs> so here we have him in the cabin. Uh, so he's gotten some kind of drop on uh, Beatrice at this point. I don't know where her gun's at. I don't know what happened. I'm guessing she, he's in her cabin because she hasn't really been showing this leaving it. And uh, that leads us to the dramatic return of Fear of God and this classic shot. I guess the choking. The choking, choking out. through a window, apparently, from the artwork. I also like that you can see the dog hair all over his jacket. <laughs> Major's hair. This is, I mean, it's a great shot. Again, for those of us looking for the suspense and kind of horror in Alfred Hitchcock, this, this movie also seems to have had it. Yeah, with the, the, the hands, the giant hands around the throat and the, the, the teeth and the glasses askew. It's kind of the most Hitchcockian kind of scene of, the, of everything we've seen so far. And you know those are his real teeth, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm sure Hitchcock saw this guy at whatever the, his version of central casting was and was like, yeah, him. So speaking of central casting, I have a surprise for you guys and a surprise for, for our viewers because I'm going to postulate something I haven't seen anywhere else right here. And that is that this ne'er-do-well, who is also part of this thing at the end, is actually someone we have seen before because I found online that Mr. Sidey from the Pleasure Garden is listed as being in the Mountain Eagle and uncredited, they didn't say what role he was. So I spent all morning looking at this picture and the next one and comparing it to Mr. Sidey without a mustache. Mr. Sidey had a mustache in the Pleasure Garden. He was the father uh, figure, I guess, at Patsy's house. But there was no other picture. I couldn't find him in there. He could just not be pictured and this could not be him. But I like the idea that this is him in a villainous role, sort of, uh, because as we see in this very next picture, he gets uh, manhandled by fear of God, also choked out. But yeah, I was comparing profiles, looking at the nose. And I was just, this nose, it's per this is him. This is Mr. Sidey from the Pleasure Garden. I'm, I stand by that, I'm putting my flag in. I like that he would go from a noble, kind character to a disreputable a local character. ruffian yes and this would also make... original scholarship this is great this is a good <laughs> this also me. makes the first time that a character has recurred in a hitchcock movie because no other character in this movie was in the pleasure garden so and as we know malcolm Keane is going to be in the lodger next week so it starts the game of tag of actors moving into the next film Okay, we're at the dramatic ending here. Apparently, uh, I, ha I have it that he's eventually caught townspeople catch up to him. Maybe they're in this cabin here. He's got this creepy David Lynch guy in the background. Here's the the here's player. holding his arm. Maybe he was about to take a swipe at Pettigrew and that guy's clutching his arm. What, like Maybe holding him back? Who, what's that? Like holding him back? I, well, look, look, you can see, you see oh, yeah. the, the, in the middle of the old guy's hand there is around the arm of, of uh, um, fear of God or, you know, clutching his hand and it looks like his uh, fist is clenched. So there is some sort of potential violence happening in this scene. We just don't know what. Mm -hmm. Somebody was about to get clocked. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking Pettigrew was about to get a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> Quite possible. The grew is in his uh, out on the town hat as well. So that's why kind of figured he's there. So here we have uh, him captured. I can't believe how many photos we have of this movie. It doesn't right? exist. Yeah. I, it almost feels like we have most of them. I think we have the whole movie basically. Uh, 
he's handcuffed and there's this weird loose uh fabric yeah what the hell is that it's like a robes belt so he's he's captured and tied up and then lo and behold th now this next picture i found was uh, on pinterest i'm not i can't confirm 100 percent it's from the movie but i figured we'll use it here so caveat to this one the return of edward the son this looks like edward the son it was listed on pinterest for sale uh saying still from mountain eagle it looks I don't know. It doesn't look tonally like it fits with the movie, but I think that is Edward. That's the same hat he was wearing. Yeah, I think that was the one that looked like a baseball cap. So I figured we'll put this in. He returns home, uh, deus ex machina at the end of the movie. Uh, kind of looks like a mime or something. It's a lot of makeup going on. It looks like Pee Wee Herman a little bit. Like a, like a more like Pee Wee Herman's uh, ne'er-do-well brother, JJ. I don't know. This is what our viewers at home paid to, well, they didn't pay for the show, but this is what they came to see is this kind of analysis. Cause I do feel there's a very Paul Rubens-esque, you know, and he was meant for children. So uh, mm. maybe he got it from this guy. I don't know. The lipstick looks similar. It is on camera. So this leads uh, Pettigrew to admit uh, he's free to go. Uh, you guys are, we're all cool now. I like to imagine he's about to shake his hand, fear of God's hand. This, this could be from anywhere in the movie. So I just wanted to put one more picture of Pettigrew at the end. And uh, leading to our happy reconciliation. Here we are, he's, they're, they're all smiling and the, the handcuffs are off. But he still has that weird, what, what is that yeah, around him? Like, I don't know. A like cat's it? cradle or something he was playing. <laughs> When they caught him. I don't know. She's holding some kind of black ball too that she was holding in the other picture as well. Who knows? What's going on here? Is this some sort of like satanic rape? All I'm gonna say is people gotta find this movie. So we we need answers to these questions. So if you go back, you can see her she's got a ring on her finger too. So Oh, definitely married at this point. Yeah, I, guess, yeah. I guess they they he had a ring and I guess the baby's still alive or maybe the baby died and they were just like, ah, whatever, babies die all the time in these days, so we'll make another one. There was only that one picture of the baby, so and we didn't even really see the baby. Just a bundle of cloth. Yep, so last picture is just, a, you know, it was supposedly a happy ending. Uh, they get to stay married happily ever after. Pettigrew is their friend and uh, that's it. That's the Mountain Eagle. Mm -hmm. You got to say the story sounds really idiotic. <laughs> and I think Hitchcock himself was quoted in Hitchcock Truffaut as saying it was a very bad movie. So nothing I've seen in this has kind of disabused me of that notion. But um, yeah, the, the fact that that the son just disappears and then just kind of shows up at the end and then uh, Pettigrew is like, oh, my bad. Let's shake on it. <laughs> and everyone's happily ever after. It's yeah. That's that's great. You're free to be married now, <laughs> you old Mountain Eagle. I don't know why he's called Fear of God. Do you think religion factored into this movie at all? What does Fear of God um, suggest to you? Like, is he a God-fearing man? Is he someone who inspires the fear of God? Uh, what's what's the what's you got? What's your read on? and how he's presented based on everything we know this kind of hermit living um living alone who's who I think he was an irish hermit so it's like fear of god that's my <laughs> irish accent yeah okay all right hello everyone this is moronic logic kenny uh sam and lance coming from the future we're coming from actually uh easy virtue because as we were preparing this video for the mountain eagle for con popular consumption I did a Google search just to make sure none of you uh, knuckleheads found something I missed. And immediately I found something we missed. So we are going to cover that really quick right now for you. Basically in 2012, there was a heritage auction sale of 24 prints from the Mountain Eagle. We kind of touched on this originally in the video, uh, but we didn't have 
all the hard information we have right now. So let me just give it to you straight. So this sale, which happened on December 15th in 2012, was for 24 11 by 14 stills from the Mountain Eagle, Alfred Hitchcock's second film. I think, oh, so here's what's interesting about the pictures. Throughout the history of film as both a business and an art form, a little known tradition has existed in the form of a courtesy from the studios to their favorite stars, producers, directors, etc., where they would give them the highest quality possible master prints of scenes for personal archival reference. So basically these 24 pictures were just made by the studio and given to Alfred Hitchcock at the completion of the movie. So, or he requested them or they get just, it was just a gift to him. These are really great quality pictures compared to some of the ones we showed earlier. Uh, they're, you know, straight, you could hang these on your wall. They're beautiful. Unfortunately, we don't have access to all 24 of them. So right off the bat, I'm gonna tell you, we have, this video has maybe eight of them. So we're gonna go over the six right now that were provided at the Heritage Auction and just kind of give you our moronic logic insight that y'all came here for. So we'll put this on pause really quick. All right, everybody, so here is the first picture. This was included in the Heritage Auction sale, uh, which is one we already, we did show you earlier. Not, it's not much, uh, you guys have anything you wanna say about this picture before we move on? I uh, know, I know. Not a thing. This one too, we talked about earlier. This was from the Heritage Sale too, as well. Stud shot, Malcolm Keane. And this one we talked about earlier, which I want to talk a little bit more with you guys. Because when we did this picture the first time, we weren't positive, 100% positive this was from the Mountain Eagle. Now we know it's from the Mountain Eagle because it was part of the Heritage Sale. It's been so long. Did we make a joke about how he looks like Paul Rubens? Yes. <laughs> We covered that angle. That angle is right. well covered. And I think I said he looked like a mime. But I think, you know, now thinking about this as being something that's in the movie, what is happening here? He is... Something creepy. Well, he had... And, and pathetic. Well, this is... Oh, my God. Edward, the son? Is that this is the name? son. The is son? he Now, he is he coming, returning? This I feel like this is end of the movie. He's coming back. But why would he be doing this? Well, his return kind of um, clears fear of God's name, right? Yeah, because now the town knows he's alive. Yeah. I mean, he could, it could that could be, you know, it's kind of the, the body language suggests to me this kind of like pensive nervousness, right? Obviously, he's kind of, but it's also kind of an intimacy, like he's hugged up against the door. Do you think it's, um, I, sorry, I've, I've, I've forgotten the, the teacher's name now. Beatrice. Beatrice, do you, do you think it's maybe he's at Beatrice's door or something like that? Maybe, I don't know, to ask her for a date. Maybe it's earlier in the movie. I, that, you know. That's a good call, actually. Maybe this is when uh, Beatrice is with his dad and he's coming to see her, you know, so before, right before he catches them. That's kind of a beautiful photo. Really is. I mean, yeah. it, it's a sharp, sharp shot. It, he is wearing a lot of makeup, though. Which is in contrast to fear of God. I noticed the last shot, he wasn't wearing that heavy stage makeup that some of the other actors are wearing. I wonder so if that's to make him look, this guy look younger. Yeah, that's probably it actually, yeah. Or does it make you think maybe the, it, was up to, it was like the, at the discretion of the actors, you know, their, their makeup and, and hair. How much did the movie, how, how much could Hitchcock tell an actor what to do at this point if he if he was like a stage actor and wanted to uh you know wanted to wear makeup because that's that's what he did was that just you know was that negotiable well Pettigrew, his dad we we read was about in his 40s when he did this movie and they obviously did a lot of makeup to make him look way older mm. Uh, so speaking of him, let's jump to the next photo. This one's brand new. Uh, wow, it looks horrible blown up like this. Uh, this one we didn't uh, talk about last time. And what I mentioned to Lance when I was telling him about these pictures earlier was, you know, we've seen a few pictures of Pettigrew kind of grappling with Beatrice, but this one you know, it's all actually clicking in my head right now. He's got her his hand over her mouth like he's stifling her from talking. 
And we just saw the scene of his son at the door knocking. And I'm now I'm wondering if there's yeah, a- Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, that's a good observation. Maybe there, I mean, yeah. I, I can only speculate as to yeah. the story, right? But it, it definitely looks like he's he's muffling her, right? Which is we didn't sure, get. Yeah, that absolutely. Time. Yeah, and his hands kind of got this kind of creepy claw on her shoulder. So, and there's all. It's not a. Um, it, it looks like he's definitely restraining her. It's not a warm embrace. No, it's not. No. So moving on, we got two more pictures. When you guys want to start with this one. Beatrice in the cabin. She's uh, shacked up with fear of God. And uh, they were living a life of isolation. And there's a kind of melancholy to it, right? It's a beautiful picture, I think. It yeah, is. I do too. I really like the, um, I, I guess that's a, I don't know what that is, that that light. Is that like from a... It's going to be an oven, right? Like an old... That's what I was thinking. Oven. It was an oven of some kind. It looks um, like it's illustrated, though. Like it's it dry. does. I wonder if that's exactly what it is. Like they they just you know the the set painters just painted an oven on the wall there. <laughs> yeah, that's but but it it works. Yeah, it's, I wonder how they got it's it. It's kind so of well. angelic, you know, and yeah, I like it. Again, like the more we've seen of these pictures, the more I'm like, you know, I, I really would be psyched to see this movie because even though the plot is horrible from everything we've discussed from earlier in this video that we decided <laughs> that we decided uh the movie some of these sh shots just really look like the scene that this would have taken place in seems like it'd be really interesting to watch visually mm. so the last picture we've got from the uh from the heritage auction is this one the best of the lot the best of the lot it kind of fills in some gaps that we were again we were guessing at last time i think we guessed relatively correctly which is that these guys are probably some sort of bounty hunters looks like they're hiding from fear of god looks like fear of god's got them pinned down well we know they both get choked out by fear of god at some point so they're either they're either after him or they're after beatrice yeah they they look like they're hiding i i, I they look slightly scared and pensive that's, they definitely both look scared. And their guns are crossing each other. It kind of, you get that they're not, they're not the most uh, experienced killers, maybe. Yeah, they're yeah. just the best they had in town, you know? I mean, yeah, the guy it, on the left, the I think his best color. days were many years yeah. ago. <laughs> the, the local color of whatever we decided or decided it wasn't either germany or kentucky or whatever it is but it there's a real hillbilly kind of quality to uh to these like um extra characters that i think probably was pretty exotic at the time to a london audience is that fair to say no i think that's fair to say i think we've noticed that you know in the pleasure garden and we noticed that here Again, we're coming from the future, so we've seen a few more movies. Uh, the fella on the right is, uh, this is a moronic, we already broke the moronic logic news earlier that this is, and I'm putting all my eggs on this basket. That is Ferdinand Martini, Mr. Sidey from the Pleasure Garden on the right there. All right. IMDB list him as being in the movie, uh, but they didn't know what his role was. And I'm going to say Bounty Hunter number two. <laughs> you sure he's not number one? I don't know. The, the other guy seems a little cooler. He, he gets the big dramatic choke through the window. And the, although someone pointed out the second uh, bounty hunter, Mr. Society, I'm going to call him, uh, he, one of the pictures we saw earlier of him had him like cackling, like just like head back and cackling at the uh, screen. And somebody mentioned that that's like, that is a Hitchcock kind of trope, like someone just jeeringly laughing uh, at people. I, it's not something I've definitely noticed yet, but uh, it's something like to keep an eye out for, I guess. Mm. It, again, it's a striking. Both of these guys are striking looking to begin with. I'm also going to guess they're at Fear of God's cabin because, so maybe they're out of their depth right now. They're in his territory. So, you know, the, maybe the hunters become the hunted. Yeah. They're, uh, they're springing a ambush of some kind maybe 
Yeah. That wooden fence on top of them. All right. Yeah. So that's it. I don't know. We came back. We, we didn't want to say we missed anything. And so far we haven't. Let me cut out of this. Any uh, final thoughts you guys want me to splice in on this movie? Well, um, you might mention we're not doing the, the, the MacGuffins for obvious reasons because, you know, we didn't actually have a film to look at. But if I, the film in my head, I would give it like zero MacGuffins. <laughs> so, but yeah. I'm going to give it the on cinema, at the cinema uh, grade. And I'm just going to say, uh, you know, it's been a long time since Mountain Eagle type movies have been done. It's really great that they did this. I think it's probably the best movie about mountain eagles that they've ever done uh you know five bags of popcorn and five bags of eagle nests sam got this uh t- tough to top that one um i just say uh you know it's it's a movie that the director didn't seem to have any special love for but uh was probably a pretty big learning experience. Um, some of the visuals looked like they were um, they were cool. And um, for whatever reason, uh, judging it, you know, comparing it to its contemporary contemporary films that were made in the, you know, by either this production company or other English films, uh, Hitchcock stood apart pretty early on because of his um, his ability to to tell stories with pictures and his uh, technical sophistication. So maybe it's maybe it's not a great movie, but it probably like The Pleasure Garden um, before that we watched, it probably had some pretty, uh, pretty striking images in it. Um, so I'm willing to bet that it wasn't a total loss, total waste. Um, and I hope it shows up someday. So uh, yeah. I don't know what the point of rating it is, but we'll give it two. Two whatevers. Two whatevers. Out of, out of five. Yeah, your your uh, review is much more thoughtful and uh, nuanced and, and generous than mine. So it actually made me feel guilty. Yeah, me too. I felt like actually revise. one of the townspeople, like with a pitchfork, yeah. and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Now somebody's speaking sense. I'm going to you know gently lay my pitchfork down against this movie. But... I think a part of it is that the story just so so I think in some of these other other movies we've watched too, the stories are are often, I mean, pretty pretty cheesy, but the, you know, there you can find something in the visuals or in the camera work, the you know, the the scenes, the the, the acting, you know, something like for Pleasure Garden, you know, there was there were moments that were kind of uh, maybe, maybe not redeemed the whole movie, but that made it tolerable. Whereas, you know, we don't see, get to see any of that. We just see a few stills. Some of them would look interesting. So we're left with just this very vague narrative that sounds just absurd, like patently absurd, um, I think, to, mo- to a modern audience. Anyway. Yeah, these movies are very convoluted, but, um, but you know, the pa- a lot of the pacing and stuff must have made sense at the time. Yeah, you know, it was just like a different... Uh, medium at that point it was it was so fresh and so new i bet the gunfight was something that was uh novel to audiences at the time oh uh, yeah hopefully someday we get to see it um but i guess until then we'll have to be happy with all these stills that kenny has collected yeah good job on that, kenny. next episode we are back with the hitchcock challenge we will be reviewing alfred hitchcock's third movie the lodger which fantastic news after episode one and two, you can actually watch a good restored version of this movie simply by, and I don't want to sound like this is a commercial because uh, it's not, and we're definitely not being paid, but the Criterion channel is a, I think it's like $10.99 a month or a hundred dollars a year. So, I mean, you're, you're already getting Netflix and Disney anyway, get the Criterion channel. It has a bunch of Hitchcock's early movies, particularly The Lodger. You can also support restored movies by buying the DVD or Blu-ray disc of it. It's over my shoulder here. I'll put a picture up. Uh, The bonus of owning the actual 
film itself is it has downhill as an extra on it. So you will be prepared for episode three and four. So you'll be able to do two of the Hitchcock challenges. So get yourself ready. Uh, you can also watch a bootleg. That's up to you. Uh, go online. Just don't tell us about it. Guys, we done here? Yeah, I think we might be. The phrase I use is moronic logic. <laughs>